Thank you, thank you for having me. It's funny, there's not as many people here in the afternoon as there were in the morning. As a professor, I'm used to that, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to send around a sheet of paper and you'll sign it and you'll get extra credit for being here. Okay, so it's true, I am, I'm 1988, uh, class of, uh, from Navy. Uh, I did fly the A4 and the F-18, so I actually know your backgrounds more than you would think. My dad was a Marine, happy Marine Corps birthday, but I had to look it up today. I'm like, it is not November 7th, it is November 10th, so quit trying to fool me. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk to you, I'm gonna talk to you today about the autonomous systems, the human role, and we're gonna touch on both some very technical and, and what I would call socio-technical policy issues. So when I tell you what I do, it's something called human supervisory control. And it's where you have a human operator, in this case, a UAV operator, and sometimes I slip and use the word drone. That's because that's what the rest of the world calls it, and we, can, we calls them, and we can have an argument about that later. But um, you've got a, a UAV operator here. I don't know if this is, there we go, sort of working. And then trying to fly, in this case, a shadow, but it's mediated by a computer in the middle. All drones are flown this way. Uh, all commercial aircraft are flown this way. Most military aircraft are flown this way. Cars are starting to be driven this way when we've got driverless cars coming. So this kind of human on the loop is really the wave of the future when you really talk about all transportation technologies. If you really wanna see um, a, another lecture that I give that's probably m more interesting in terms of where you see UAVs in the rest of the world, you can go on YouTube and you can see uh, where I talk about everywhere else in the world you see uh, UAVs and related technology. So, but I want to give you a couple of definitions for th today's purposes, and that is, what you hear the word autonomous bandied about a lot, but what does that really mean? Uh, so, first you need to understand what an automatic system is. An automatic system is one that acts according to a pre-programmed script with defined entry and exit conditions. This is basically a very specific, it's called a deterministic computer algorithm. It's a set of if-then-else rules. Your thermostat in your house is automatic. Nuclear power plants are automatic. Uh, um, lots of things that f in jets are automatic. Right? Now that's not the same as autonomous. An autonomous system, it's really something with a bunch of probabilities in it. That it means that you have a system that is independently and dynamically determining if, when, and how to execute a task. These are stochastic systems. That's how you get a PhD, is that you both know how to spell and use stochastic in a sentence. Okay? Now, I, and I'm only partially kidding. Uh, so, <laughs> later at a bar someday, I'll give you the list of words that make you a true academic. You'll hear them here. Epistemology is one that, if you haven't heard it yet, they'll sneak it in on you. Uh, so, this is basically a set of probabilistic algorithms. Instead of an if-then-else, it's basically saying, on this probabilistic continuum, how likely is this set of conditions, given some Bayesian, uh, some prior beliefs, you might hear that a lot in these systems, and, and we're gonna make a decision, it's kind of a guess. It's a computer's best guess. But computers guess. Autonomous systems are guessing machines. So, and, and you know, what we hope is that they're good guessers, but you have to understand that when you hear the word autonomy in your head, the very first word you should think is guess. It's a guessing machine. And by the way, you are an autonomous system. You are a guessing machine, particularly in the military. When you go into battle, the fog of war, you, you are actually given a lot of autonomy and you have to make your best guess going into certain circumstances. And it's a continuum. It's not, one system is not 100% automatic or 100% autonomous. The Matrix, go watch that, that's autonomous. That's a fully autonomous system, okay? Anything other than that is partially autonomous. And sometimes I see in the, and in fact, you know, the military, all UAVs in operation today are automatic. They are not autonomous. Maybe the Predator and the Grey Eagle have a tiny bit of autonomy in them when they do the automatic takeoff and landing, tiny bits, but for the most part, they're automatic systems. The X-47, some new, Drones maybe coming out of DARPA, you know, they're going to be more autonomous, but I can promise you, you haven't seen anything yet in terms of what's coming out in terms of autonomy. Now, but one thing that I see that gets confused a lot in and around the military is confusing an autonomous platform with an autonomous weapon 
or an automatic platform with an automated weapon, right? The Patriot is really an automated weapon, all right? But that's not a platform, okay? The platform is the vehicle, I, and I know I'm lecturing to the, uh, preaching to the choir, but the platform is actually, in most cases, divorced from the weapon that it can fire. So you can put a potential autonomous weapon that can go out and decide who it wants to kill on its own, that doesn't necessarily have to go on a UAV. It could go on a UGV, it could go on a UUV, it could go on, you know, it could, on, on any vehicle, a ground robot, that, um, that any propulsion device is a platform that could launch a weapon which may or may not be autonomous. And that's important because there's a huge debate internationally, and I, and I speak around the world on this, about you cannot necessarily ban all UAVs because they can carry autonomous weapons. I mean, that's, it's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. If you want to address autonomy of weapons, that's actually separate from the technology. But let's talk about why we would have autonomous systems. There's base, three basic reasons, cost safety, cost, safety, and performance. Cost. Do we have any Air Force people here? Good really love picking on the Air Force. I'm sorry, I just spent all those years being brainwashed by the Navy and it really pays off later um, when we talk about UAVs. Uh, this is a great example of, you know, the, I'm gonna pick a lot on the Air Force right now. I'm sorry for people in the Air Force, but let me, let me just pick on the Navy a little bit. At least the Air Force has a UAV program that they can be picked on, right? The, the Navy has failed miserably in getting a real program of record for a UAV. So that, there's a caveat, and so it makes some Air Force people happy. Okay, so we've got a U-2 and a Global Hawk. It's only recently, about 10 years too late, did Congress actually decide to enforce upon the Air Force that they need to get rid of the U-2 and use the Global Hawk. It is so much cheaper to fly the long surveillance, the 24-7 surveillance missions using a Global Hawk. Uh, if, if you've not, not ever been to Korea, and I, I did a lot when I was in the Navy, I did a lot of operations with the Air Force um, um, out in Westpac. Those guys, you know, I'm a pilot. Who here's a pilot? Who has ever worn those full-length diapers as a pilot? Oh, I saw one and a half. One guy's like, I'm not going to admit that. Let me tell you, these things are miserable to wear. They're really, they're a diaper. They go from basically here down to your feet, and that's how you go to the bathroom if you're a U2 pilot. You basically sit in your urine for however many hours. That, I mean, this is, I'm, I, I don't mean to be gross, but, you know, any time that you're sitting in your own urine for that many hours, that might be a good time for, to automate something. I'm just saying. That's a good, that's a good basic rule. Okay, but it took the Air Force forever. And, you know, I mean, I, and I lived it, right? I, and I, my squadron got kicked out of Kadena because we were always fighting with the Air Force guys at the club. I mean, I lived that life. I know how, what it's like to be an Air Force pilot. You really are at the top of the heap. And it's in terms of promotion and who's running the Air Force, nobody wants to let a nerdy guy with no real flight experience run the Air Force. Nobody wants that. They want, you know, the fighter guy. And before the fighter guys, by the way, it was the B-52 guys, right? So it, it represents for the Air Force a real psychological stepping point for them to, to get um, the man out of the cockpit. But by the way, General Hap Arnold, who is actually one of my favorite um, uh, flag officers ever, what, he was an Army and then an Air Force officer, he predicted that they would have um, unmanned aircraft 60 years ago, 60, 70 years ago. So he was a real visionary. But let's just see, you know, in a more practical concern for you pilots out there, so how much does it cost to have an F-15 or F-16 pilot now run your Predator missions? That's, that's the word TX, it means transition pilot. It actually costs the Air Force $2,100 an hour to have that guy learning how to uh, fly a Predator. SUPT is the Air Force word for just out of flight school. So if you just go out of baby flight school, it only costs the Air Force $500 an hour to do that mission. And then they have a new program called the Beta Program where they just basically go get anybody off the street who has a college degree to go fly that. And it turns out that they're all about equivalent in capability. Uh, the beta guys are only $150 an hour. Now, we can't put a price on war, can we? Yes, we can, and we have to, right? I mean, this is where the government is right now. We've got to become more cost conscious, and it makes absolutely no sense if you can basically get effective performance capabilities to, to be taking F-15 and F-16 guys, and I can promise you, I've sat in a lot of Predator trailers. 
Those guys hate it. Anybody here, Predator Pilot? I'm not going to tell you. How, I'm not going to make you tell me how much you hate it, uh, because we have a great quote from an interview that got, the guy says it is just like sheer mind-numbing boring. Okay, safety. All right. So this is what the accident rates look like for all aircraft in the United States, all the way from commercial aircraft, which is very low, thankfully, uh, out to male hail UAVs. This is medium altitude, high altitude UAVs, Predators, Global Hawks. This is really the only um, significant data set that we have to make this comparison. And this is basically, we have a full data set from 1990 to, to 2011. So, uh, and then you'll see somewhere in there, you know, uh, military cargo. For military flights, military cargo is the safest, surveillance, bomber, fighter attack, um, which are almost equivalent, then rotorcraft, gen general aviation. That's actually a big one. General aviation, unsafe. Those people should be turned into drones as soon as possible. Well, let's look at that. So, but that, that this graph right here is actually not that informative. That's actually like asking what the United States commercial aviation record was like in the 1930s. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a new industry, it's new technology. So that's not really a fair comparison. What if we look at the accident rates in the last couple years? You have to remember that UAVs are basically a self-regulated group in the military uh, because they're actually the military puts no safety criteria on them per se because they're weapons of war. We don't really have to, we wanna push the envelope. That being said, the industry has self-regulated. In the last two years, something really important has happened, hello, Air Force, that in fact, in the last couple years, the rate, you can see it right here, the rate has dropped down to below five. And by the way, this is measured per accidents per 100,000 flight hours, meaning uh, death or over a million dollars of um, damage. What happened here? Something really big. It dropped almost half. And not only that, what are we safer than now? It is actually safer today for the Air Force to send a UAV on a fighter-bomber mission than to send a manned aircraft. This is huge. This is huge, and it was buried by the Air Force, right? I, for obvious reasons. If that is the case, if we should be sending drones out on these missions, then what does that make everybody in the Air Force, right? So I, I predict that you will see this. Um, this is definitely going to. This trend is going to go down. In fact, if you actually do the linear extrapolation, this means that in 10 years, commercial aircraft, commercial um, planes would be as safe as drones. Now, I'm not saying that that's necessarily going to happen. That that's a whole other discussion about whether or not. We can never truly have a passenger airplane with drunk passengers in a drone. I don't think so. Uh, but, but you can also see another big drop, another not change was general aviation. So that, that's a good indicator to you that general aviation is a good metric to see how one safety record is maintained, but as technology becomes more and more innovative, we see huge improvements. And of course, mission objectives. I mean, in the end, that's kind of why we have these things. Do we get better mission performance? And, um, you know, there's no question that the Global Hawk has revolutionized the way that we can get um, really surveillance anytime, anywhere. Uh, the, and these aircraft are highly automated. Um, and even the X-47, you know, as much as I'm not crazy about NAVAIR and their inability to actually field a program, I mean, they are making progress. And, um, uh, and uh, but it's long in coming. Uh, you know, I, I'll give it, Admiral, close yours for a second. I'll give it to the Navy. They did, they did a great media spectacular about showing that the X-47 can land and take off by itself. It was a big media deal. By the way, I flew the A-4 and the Hornet. Guess what's been taken off and landing itself on an aircraft carrier for a long time? The Hornet. You're not even allowed to touch the controls on the takeoff. So, you know, I, I will give it to the Navy because they won up the Air Force in um, technology, but that's a good story to tell you that the technology has actually been there for a long time. We've been, since the 90s, we've been taking planes off and landing them by themselves on aircraft carriers, right? So, so we're actually a little bit behind the curve in my futuristic view as a professor of where we should be. But the real um, value of these systems is actually not, not necessarily that they can take off and land by themselves, is that they basically collapse the kill chain immensely, right? Now we have vehicles that, get, that can not only, they can find, they can fix, they can track, they can target, they can engage, and they can assess the same vehicle and put no human at risk, right? So there's no question that this has been a major game changer. Uh, I think what, what we've really struggled with as a joint service, although the Army is actually, they're, they're pretty impressive because they don't have a lot of legacy history to get, to get past, still, even at that, 
our operations have been revolutionized by the appearance of UAVs. Now, so Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman did not pay me to get up here and tell you that. I mean, that's, you know, I, I, I work a lot with the military, all three brand, about four, it depends on how you count them, of the service. And so um, I, I've seen it across the board what drones can do. But now let's talk about some problems, because I think as they're all automatic, remember that we talked about now, but as we start to move towards autonomy, you could imagine a case where um, if we can actually, you know, there have been a few cases, for example, where the Global Hawk has lost calm. And what happens is it has a set of if-then-else algorithms that it, that it defers to to take itself in for an automated landing. And we've never lost one. And it's actually happened several times that it's lost calm. And so it's, it's very, the, the systems are very good under some very, straightforward conditions. Now, no, nobody was shooting at it. I know that the A2D world is big. This is actually something that you hear a lot about coming out of the Pentagon now. And so we do need to make some substantial changes in our control systems, meaning we've got to up the autonomy if we're going to work in those worlds. But here's some issues. Yes, Donald Rumsfeld was right. There are some unknown unknowns. Um, this is one of my favorites. So you guys aren't nerdy like me, so you're not really following the, the academic, high-tech um, Silicon Valley literature. But about a year ago, this researcher from Stanford was made world famous because he basically developed this artificially intelligent algorithm that could search YouTube videos for cats. And so, and his video, and, and his algorithm could recognize a cat in, a, uh, in just a random YouTube video. This, and this was all over the media. And in my world, you know, this guy, is, it's, it's effectively like MacArthur coming back from World War II. Yay, this is amazing. And I was like, well, I don't know about that because I do the same research. I'm like, that seems awfully suspicious to me. Uh, because theoretically, if you have some algorithms that can watch vid videos and pick out a cat, I mean, you could make, make the leap to what DARPA would want to do with that. So you actually, if you actually read the paper, and this is actually that, that four-letter word, it's almost like a missing art, you know, read it in detail, slowly, not in a text message. Uh, what you'll find out is the algorithm worked 16% of the time, one six percent So 16% of the time it was able to recognize a cat in a YouTube video. You're better off flipping a coin. And, and I'll give it to the authors. They did not actually overclaim it in the paper so much, but what, ha what they said was that they made some like 70% improvement over the state of the art, which was some other obscure algorithm, which I will not bore you with, right? So yes, they made a huge improvement over with the algorithms that people were using before, but it was still only correct 16% of the time. This is absolutely nothing that we would want to put even anywhere near a battlefield, right? But to hear the media, and in fact, lots of people in the Pentagon heard um, vision recognition is awesome, and uh, the Pentagon starts paying out people uh, to do these, to do more research. And I'm not saying they shouldn't do the research, but I, I, I start to object in when we start to think that we can operationally field a system. And that's kind of what you're seeing over here. So this was a company called Exponent. They were working on the small UGV, unmanned ground vehicle, and it's maybe a little hard to pick out, but right there you've got two twin-barreled shotguns. This thing is actually obviously in the field. They were in a village nearby. Um, from what you're seeing here, they let it go. It actually has basically an autonomous feature on it where it can be enabled to use its vision sensors and to basically determine that it's um, maybe being attacked and to fire at will. So that is a functionality uh, programmed into it. Uh, the Army guys do not trust this at all. It's never been, in their minds, has not been proven to work effectively. They sent it into this village, and remember, they're remote, and they actually can't see anything because the cameras were covered up. They could tell it wasn't moving, and then eventually they just said, okay, let's go into the village and find out what happened to our robot, and this is the scene that they came upon, which is, so, as a mother of a seven-year-old, so, so, so cute. Would have been so, so, so bad had that thing been left on automatic fire, and because I can tell you right now, robots do not know children from adults. Uh, at this point in time, and so this could have ended up really bad. All right, uh, the X factor. Um, let's go ahead and if we can get that first link um, clicked. I'm going to show you, um, just so you really can get an appreciation for where we are in the state of robotics today. 
So it's something called the X factor that I like. It's actually not the cool factor. It's actually how fast roboticists are speeding up videos. So this is some new humanoid, brand new humanoid research. This is a DARPA project. Anybody, anybody catch that? I mean, they didn't put it in two small letters. What it, this is a ro robot climbing stairs, by the way. Really, really, it's like the, it's like the holy grail of robots. All right, anybody, so how fast was that? Is that real time? Four times, okay, let's just, and, and we'll just, don't, don't change it, okay. All right, now, let's see, let's play that back, the next one please, let's play that back in real time. Okay, so if you're a real robot, if you're a real soldier going into battle with this um, humanoid robot, let's see what that really looks like. Same thing. Woo, woo. Yeah, awesome. I am totally going into battle with that guy. <laughs> and, and let me tell you, okay, so let me tell you some other robotist trickery that you don't know to look for, right? Because this isn't what you do for a living. Anybody know what this is right here? Yeah, it's a power source. I got news for you. We cannot go into battle with any robots until we've got a much uh, better battery um, that uh, right now the battery that would run this would basically be twice the weight of the robot. So we, we have no power source actually to do this. Anybody see anything else that seems kind of off base? Look, look at the top. What's the top? What's, what do you got? What do we got going on at the top? It's actually a couple of ropes to help stabilize because we don't have something called proprioception figured out. It, proprioception is the way that your brain and your vestibular system kind of know where your arms and legs are at any given time. You know, so when I do this, I'm not even thinking about how to balance. I just do. Uh, robots cannot do that. There's also one little other thing that's kind of hard to notice. I, okay, you can sort of, well, not the guy cleaning. Okay, and now you can sort of see the guy that just came into view right there on the laptop. He's at, the robot's climbing is actually being, um, he's basically being tuned by the guy on the, ro uh, on the computer in the background. Okay, now I'm not doing this to pick on Drexel because Drexel's doing a great job. This is research, this is 6-1 research. But if I wasn't here to tell you, to point out all of those things to you, it is very likely that you would have missed it. And in your mind, and in many flag officers' mind, Admiral, please close ears, you know. Uh, <laughs> They see this and they're like, awesome, we are totally gonna fund this. Let's give that company a billion dollars and we are gonna have robots going into war, you know, in a couple of years, right? And we're and 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 we'll come back to this issue because it's a it's a real problem. And by the way, if you there's the DARPA does these competitions all the time, we call them paint drying. Uh, definitely go, because it's really boring. Um, all right, so uh, and, and I, I like to use this cartoon because it kind of shows you the mindset of a typical roboticist, which is, you know, we're going to, we think that we can design the human out, but we'll leave the human around just to intervene in case something goes wrong, right? And, and I will tell you the whole recent reason I went back to and got my PhD and started a research lab is to get away from this model and to go towards the human and automation autonomy collaborative model. Let's work jointly together because instead of trying to replace humans, we need to recognize that there's a place uh, for humans. Now, there's some other issues at this ethics conference. I thought it would be worthwhile to bring up. You know, there are some issues with autonomy uh, and what it does to our sense of ethics or perhaps a lack thereof. So um, there is a huge international push, pretty much led by the Human Rights Watch, and this is what I've put up here. This is their um, most recent report called Losing Humanity. I mean, they are really, really, I mean, you just say the word robot. Forget Rosie the robot on the Jetsons, which I totally want one, by the way. And we're not, we're not gonna see that in my lifetime. Uh, they are really anti-robot, anything robot, which is unfortunate because when you get this kind of passion about anti-technology, it's very Luddite, um, a lot gets lost in translation. That being said, I actually do think that if, when you look at the core of the issues that the Human Rights Watch people and other groups like the Human Watch, the International Committee for the Red Cross, there are some really core issues that we do have to think about, right? And so I think it's important to separate the passion and a lot of the, you know, just over the top statements about, and, and of course you get videos like the Russian YouTube video of the UAV firing a machine gun. 
that was not real. That was faked, right? But again, people don't get that some things are real and some things are faked. So this actually came from a, um, a, a retired Air Army, this graph here on the right, um, Army officer named Dave Grossman. And he's been doing research on, his lab is called the Killology Lab. That's pretty cool. Uh, and he's actually been doing research on what it takes for one human being to kill another human being for, for many, many years. And he came up with this idea that, you know, you've got, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat killing, you know, at the physical distance from the target all the way out to max range and bomber artillery. And this was actually before drones, UAVs came on the market, which you could actually park out here somewhere now. And the whole idea is that it actually, the resistance killing goes up. I mean, the closer you are to somebody, the less you're likely to kill them. And he's gone back through all kinds of wars, all kinds of people. There was not nearly as much bayonet killing as we ever thought there were. Of course, as a former Naval Academy midshipman who had to run around with those drill rifles, kind of resentful about that, uh, those bayonets. Uh, but, but it's much easier for us to kill with bombers, drones possibly. And, and I do get asked this question a lot. I mean, I do a lot of interviews, and that's the first thing that people say is like, but drones make it so much easier for us to kill. I'm like, yes, maybe, but so did the longbow, right? I mean, this is, this is part of war. We've been backing up that distance since the Middle Ages, right? And so, yes, it is true that we do want to back up the distance, but it is possible that that distance actually, it causes something that I call the moral buffer. It actually helps us maybe give up a, a moral argument for the legitimacy of all the technology that's in the middle. And to kind of show you an example of something that I ran across in my PhD research, this is an actual, and this was approved by the Navy. The Navy gave me this to show. Um, this is actually a strike generation tool uh, circa mid-90s where, you know, they're putting together a tomahawk strike and they're putting salvos together and, and this little cute happy dog says, done, now you may select a salvo, review it, and generate an indigo mission. That basically says, I'm about to launch all these missiles and kill a bunch of people. And because and, and, and I, I was doing some tomahawk research for my uh, dissertation, and at first when I saw this, I was grossly offended. I mean, I, I had just walked out of fighters. I'm like, could we put a growl on that dog? Could we put like a studded collar? Come on, this is war. I mean, why, why do we do this? And then if you actually dig in the literature, you know, it wasn't a military person who designed this, by the way. It was a civilian support contractor who, you know, found that tool set inside Microsoft and just feels good about it and likes it, right? I mean, and this is just one small example of like, wow, it's just it's so much easier to take. Oh, yeah, this is so cute. I'm not oh, this is just a game, you know, it's not really, it's not really, you know, serious warfare. And I think that when we start to extrapolate, yeah, you know, I mean, I've seen the videos, I've sat in the trailers, you know, I've flown the planes. It is easier to push a button when you're further away, okay? It is a lot easier when you're not under stress. That being said, it's also a lot easier to not make a wrong decision. And when I tell people about, yes, it, it is possible that drones, because of the distance, they might make us, it, they might make pushing that button easier, but what has fundamentally changed is this whole idea of warfare uh, by committee. I never had a lawyer in the loop in any of my missions, and a lawyer sitting inside the kill chain is very common today, right? And so, in a way, technology has opened up new doors, um, possibly, but it's actually made some doors, uh, it's harder to go through, and and it is true that it's depersonalizing, you know, from an F-18 five miles over target, I mean, you're in, you're out. You're not, you're not there. You're not emotionally invested. I've worked with a lot of guys who are overhead a village for months. They learn the people, they learn their spouses, they learn their mistresses, they learn their kids, their dogs, you know, their, and that's what they call the patterns of life. And then they have to do a mission that potentially could end up killing some of those people, right? And so in that way, it actually is a lot harder than when I was there. And so these are not any examples to say one form of warfare is necessarily better or worse than the other. It's just different. And we need to recognize that, and this is you know, the kind of setting where you're here at the War College to do that, is to start thinking through these issues. How is it different and how can we maybe think about um, doing something about that in the future to make it safer and better. Now, I'm going to touch on something that's kind of, or you, you'll think it's orthogonal to the whole message today, but when I come back to it, you're going to start to get how this is a huge game changer. 
drone, uh, the, the commercialization of drones. So Amazon made this big announcement last year, almost a year ago, that they were going to start doing package delivery. Huge debate as to whether or not this was a publicity stunt. I can promise you it wasn't. Uh, there's lots of research being done and development. Amazon is, in fact, actually one of my students is at Amazon today um, coaching them because we're actually trying to work on an air traffic control system for the future for how we're going to do this. Uh, but they weren't the first. They, not by a long shot. There was a company called Zucall in Australia that six, eight months before Amazon even thought about making this announcement, they made their announcement and they actually have a regulatory infrastructure in Australia to make textbook delivery by drones um, a lot easier. And so, uh, you know, by the way, the United States, we're never first to anything. Um, you know, we do have a, an impressive UAV inventory, but we really just copy from Israel. And, you know, in this case right here, eh, yeah, not the first, but, but we're the first to commercialize it, maybe. Probably not, actually. Um, and then something actually curiously happened a few months later, and this isn't that long ago, that really made me do a double take. And that is the big dog. Anybody ever seen that thing on the YouTube videos? It's pretty cool. I mean, I'm a big, I'm a big um, outdoorsy person. I like to do backpacking. I would so, so, so love to have a big dog with me to take all my crap, right? I mean, this, I just can't wait to see. And so you can see why the military has been sponsoring all this research. But not anymore. Who makes, who makes the big dog? Anybody know? Not far from here, Boston Dynamics. Who's, who owns Boston Dynamics? It used to be Boston Dynamics, but it does not anymore. Who owns it? Google. Google. At the same time, Google bought seven other top robotics companies in the world. In one day, Google bought up the eight best robotics companies in the world. And you know, a, a month later, I was actually briefing some people at OSD. I'm like, you know what tells me you people are out of touch? If you, the day that happened, the fact that you didn't hold an emergency meeting that day to find out, let's, let's get our arms around this, what's happening. And you know, the, this is a senior person, I won't tell you his name at OSC, he said, we're thinking about scheduling a meeting. We're thinking about it. I'm like, oh, you, that ship has already sailed. Because what you don't know about the commercial world, and it was hard for me, when I did the military to civilian transition, you know, I mean, you, you get into this world where you think the military technology, that's where all the money is, that's why we have these companies. I got news for you, nobody wants to make military things anymore because the money is not nearly as good as it is in the commercial world. So Google did not buy Boston Dynamics to make money off of military contracts. That money just simply isn't there at the, at the levels that they want it there. They bought that Boston Dynamics to make commercial robots that they can sell worldwide because that's where the real market is. And I gave this talk, a very similar talk, to a group of people, and I did not know a senior VP at Google was in the audience. And I said, and here's what Google, I, I said, I do not have any insider knowledge, but here's what I bet Google is going to do. Google is going to honor whatever military contracts it has, and it's going to let them run out, and it's never going to do any more military research. And he came up to me afterwards and said, you are right about that. And I'm like, I knew I was, because I work with all these robotics companies, right? And I think it, it is hard for us to think about. It. It's hard for the Pentagon to get their head around it, that not everybody wants to play with them. Not everybody thinks it's cool being part of the U.S. defense machine. And in fact, what we're going to talk about even more is it's becoming less and less cool. I'm sorry to diss everyone in the room. I don't mean to, I don't want you to think that you, because, you know, I serve my country. Serving your country is great. But from an economic perspective, it's just not the way it used to be. You know, it was back in the 80s. We had a Russia. The Russians were coming across the border. We had a real enemy. Let me tell you another problem that the government has. It's a very common problem, particularly with bureaucratic agencies. We love things. We love hardware. We love, in our government, to fund things that go pyong, pyong, weapons, things that go really fast, things that make cool noises. That's what we love to fund, things that make really good movies. You know, and I'm only half kidding here uh, because I actually worked for O&R, um, Office of Naval Research, as an uh, IPA, which is where the, basically the Navy rented me from MIT for a couple of years to help them run a robotic helicopter program. And boy, did, it was a great experience because I really learned a lot. I really learned that we've been spending a lot of money in the Navy on something called a rail gun, which is an electromagnetic gun, which most flag officers cover his ears. Love, they love the electromagnetic gun. 
most of them are not physicists and don't realize that the size of a ship that it would take to power the railgun that we think we want would be the size of Bermuda. You know, so it's, it's a pretty big power source. Onar says, we're working on it. We're, we're working, we were researching those issues, right? But we have, this country has funded, and I poke fun at the railgun, but let, let, me, let me bring the Air Force and let me do some equal opportunity poking. By the way, the Air Force, their equivalent to this is anything hypersonic. The Air Force continues to pour unbelievable amounts of money into hypersonics. I got news for you. We know pretty much everything we need to know in terms of the big ticket items for hypersonics. Pointy nose, make it super pointy, uh, uh, put a really big engine on it, and um, you know there's certain altitude regimes that you can work in, and it's also really super expensive to fly at hypersonic speeds, which Concord you know, had, had its uh, share of troubles. Uh, but we keep spending money in there because it's really cool. And I work at Wright Pat, by the way, and the Air Force funds my research, and they are so in love with hypersonic research. Okay, now let me just say, you're just like, so why is that a bad thing? Yes, could we use faster things? Maybe. Could we use really cool electromagnetic rail guns? Yeah, I mean, it's still pretty darn futuristic. We're gonna have to solve a, some serious hard equations to get that to be really operational. But what we're doing is we're putting our eggs in the wrong basket. So the government pours money into the hardware because it's so cool. Consequently, they, they do not fund software development. And guess what powers autonomous systems? <coughs> software. It's almost all software. There is some hardware underlying it. You know, so I'm not saying we should just ditch all hardware research. But we need, to, we need to seriously rebalance our, our research portfolio because we're not doing enough software development. But let me tell you who is. All right, so, just, so if you think that I'm just up here spouting off, this is some public, um, you can go get this off the internet. This is a snapshot from 20 to 2012 where we have the most recent data about corporate R&D intensity. So this is how much companies are spending as part of their overall profit, and they're putting that money back into research to figure out where they think the next big leaps are. So this is the defense industry up here. Um, there's UTC Aerospace. So they basically have an 8% corporate R&D intensity, um, and their average annual growth rate is up here. Um, so pretty healthy, and it's funny, I work with a, a lot of these companies in this graph, and I would actually say, I, I, my sense is that's correct. You, oh, thank you, thank you. Oh my God, this thing is huge. Okay, um, oh, it's like it's a lightsaber. Um, all right, so, uh, so yes, I think UT, UTC Aerospace, doing pretty good for defense companies. Boeing, also work with Boeing, or at least I did before they ran out of money, and uh, this is reflective of my experience. Boeing's in the negative. This is bad. This is bad. Boeing is huge, not just for uh, military, but for commercial uh, research, commercial air research, negative, bad, bad. Raytheon's on its way down, bad. GE, bad. Uh, you know, so th this, is, this is bad. And not only, okay, so now let's jump over here. Well, okay, these are the software companies in the world. Google. Intel, probably a bunch of companies you've never even heard of. Uh, Nokia, not surprisingly, recently absorbed into Microsoft, right? And so now Microsoft's probably even worse. Probably Microsoft is down here. Now, why this is important to you to recognize is, yes, in fact, um, the defense industry is not holding up with the software industry. And in fact, if you superimpose the defense industry, I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is sad. I mean, our best person our best company out there doing the most innovative research is we're not even close to what Google is doing. Google could start its own military any day now. Google bought Titan Aerospace. Google is going to have surveillance capability from a drone that exceeds anything that the CIA can do in just two to five years. You mark my word. And you know why? That's because my students are not going to work for Boeing. My students are not going to work for Northrop Grumman. My students are not going to work for the US government. That's not, even on, that's not even on their radar. My students are going to work for Google. My students are going to work for Oracle. The top brains, there is a massive brain drain right now to Silicon Valley and to other places like Silicon Valley, commercial. The brain drain is not going into the defense industry, which is, 
it's, it, it is just, to me, phenomenal. When I, in the 80s, 90s, you know, when I was just getting out of college, working for Boeing, working for Lockheed Martin, working for Lawrence Livermore, I mean, this was amazing. This was like the, the dream come true. I'm working for a national lab. I'm working for Boeing. Now when you talk to students, they're like, yeah, I guess I'd work for Boeing if I didn't have any other options. It's just a whole different ball game out there. And, and where is this ball game being driven? It's being driven at the software level. And so now I hope that puts it into context about if the Navy and the Air Force keep investing all these resources into, they're, they're basically investing their resources here in the losers. They're not investing their resources in the software development, which is where the game is going to be played, which is why Google and, Oracle and Amazon, I mean, Google and Amazon, they just started their own lobby for drones. Does anybody, I mean, when I read, when I read that, everybody was like, this is a whole new game, because the FAA has not been allowing any commercialization, and when Google and Amazon team together, these are, again, resources that, that put any nation to shame. It's, it's good, game's on, fight's on. Okay, my last slide, and then we'll take some questions. So I know it kind of sounds, my message sounds kind of negative. Um, and I don't want it to be negative. I really, I'm, I'm here to adjust your perspective about robotics, where robotics sits in the world, where militaries do not sit, in, you know, do and do not sit in the robotics playing field. For a long time, the military did have all the innovations. So not just our military, is Israel, other countries were, were big innovators in robotics. There's been a distinct shift. That distinct shift has gone over to the commercial world, and that's going to be a big game changer. Um, but I will say one of the things, and, and I talk about the perception showstopper, and there's basically two elements to that. When we say perception in robotics, we actually mean um, how do we make a robot see or sense the world around them. So, um, you know, the really slow climbing, stair climbing robot I showed you, what, the big problem there is perception. We, we actually, having a robot see the world, it's still the holy grail. So. And I love this. This, this robot here is from DARPA. It's called Atlas. It's supposed to be, it, do you, does anybody know what, this one, what they bill this as? This is the robot that's going to come save you on the battlefield. I'm like, the American public sees this, and it's like Terminator all over again. You know, I'm not having this thing pick me up. Um, and, um, but what's funny about this scary looking, life saving robot. Are the technologies in this robot are actually almost virtually the same technologies that are in driverless cars. So driverless cars are actually just as scary, from, from my perspective, from a technologist's perspective, these two technologies are equally scary because they both cannot sense the world very well around them. Um, but if you go out and poll the American public and you say, which of these two robots would you like to have? Oh, absolutely, the car. I, in fact, I'll tell you that car is pretty darn lethal right now um, because we just, we're not quite at the level that we would need to be for it to be truly driving you around with, with nobody behind the steering wheel. We'll get there, but it, that day is not today. But what I find interesting about this, it's a framing bias, and that's worth remembering when you're talking about robotic technologies. You know, you put that cute, you put a cute, you know, electric car package around a robot, people like it. You make it look like DARPA, the DARPA scary robot, people don't like that. Right? But ultimately, effectively, it's the same technology. And we have to separate, and part of that is we need separating the platform from the mission. We've got to make sure that people understand that the vehicle itself is not the same thing as that weapon that we're firing. I find that most people's hatred of drones and UAVs is really driven by CIA policies of targeted killing. They actually, the military does, for the most part, a great job of overseeing those missions. And I just sat on a, a very high-level uh, committee with General John Abizad, who, uh, and we recommended that, um, in fact, the CIA be forced to give up drone operations and have it turned over to the military, because we think the military operates uh, UAVs in a very responsible way. And the CIA is, it's, it's not that they're irresponsible, but nobody knows because nobody has any insight into their processes. And, and because the targeted killing program that, this uni that the United States has is so opaque, it's very difficult for anybody to defend or you know, to even try to explain what our process is there. And that brings me to the DOD 3000.09 
which um, says that right now in this country, we will not allow a robot to fire at will um, to kill offensively. We have to kind of make that caveat because, in fact, the Patriot, um, there's some other weapon systems that potentially defensively fire, and everybody seems okay with that. Um, the 3000.09 is very interesting because it's a big step. It was a great step that the, the U.S. government took, there, and there, in fact, even by today, the, we are the only country in the world who's actually put it in writing that we will not let a robot shoot to kill offensively. But of course, if you read it, anybody read it? Read it closely, it says, but there is a loophole. There are basically these four people who if they say it's okay, um, then it's okay. Which I think is good because, you know, I went to the Naval Academy. Uh, there's a clear chain of accountability there. Um, my concern is, is that I, I'd like to sit down with those four guys and say, have you seen this Drexel video? Do you, know, do you know what we've got going on here? Do you know what's really going on under the hood? You know, so my concern is, is that because we've got this massive brain drain from the government and the defense industry, I'm not 100% sure that if we ever came to that point where we wanted to make that decision, that we actually had enough qualified people in the government to effectively make that decision. And that, that kind of leads me to my last point. Uh, this government is going to we are going to have to do something serious, seriously soon. Um, or we, or not. I mean, it's funny, is it because it's kind of a, I had this intellectual argument with myself. Is it really that big of a deal? I mean, maybe, maybe the rise of the corporate nation is just kind of where we are in history. Maybe it's right that Google and Amazon will become more powerful as militaries than a nation. You know, I don't know. It, it, see, it doesn't set well with me, but you know, I'm like, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I'm not sure how I feel about the distributed knowledge. Uh, you know, I mean, you can look at Edward Snowden to figure out, you know, with the prison program. The fact of the matter is, this government could not have done that without the help of Facebook and all the internet service providers and Google and Yahoo, when you see that list of, of people that agreed to do this, it just could not have happened without the corporate nations um, agreeing to do it. So when you see that kind of shift in power and capability, and the shift has moved from hardware to information, you know, you have to think about that. So how, how, do, we, how do we, it's not even defend against it. I mean, how do we actually, pivot, and it's kind of a, definitely an overused word, how do we pivot the government and the defense industries to understand that there's this whole new game in information management, and, you know, we, we can't even get, you know, the NMCI um, network, the, Na the Navy Marine China interface, that's what we called it at ONR, right, uh, you know, because we can't even protect our own email programs, right? Surely that's not the first time you've heard that joke, I mean, that. <laughs> So I think that we have to really think about, um, you know, uh, the government structure. And, and you know, it, it can stem from little policies like, you can't pay these people enough to do it, by the way. There's this rule in the government that you cannot make, I think civilians cannot make something more like $185,000 a year because you can't make more than the Secretary of the Navy. That might sound like a lot of money to some of you young pups in the room, but I wouldn't accept that salary. I wouldn't accept, I'm, I, you know, the government cannot pay me what I can make in the civilian world. And so there's also a big change in the money to be made in the corporate commercial world. And this is, you know, I mean, if people could make a lot of money in the defense and the government, I mean, they would, they would, but you know, it's really not all about money either. People love the idea of going to war and, and working and serving their country. But unfortunately, the government is incredibly inflexible now about how to let people um, be innovative. I mean, you, you know, my, my students literally, I've had, I have so many students who have already started and failed and started and failed and started a third very successful company. Lots, lots of students. So it's just a different world that we live in today that entrepreneurism, I mean, it's, it's actually majors now. You can get majors in innovation and entrepreneurial um, endeavors in college right now. So we've got to really think about um, incentivizing a workforce, keeping a workforce, giving them access to technologies and, and capabilities that, that make it worth doing. Um, because if we don't, we're going to be back, well, you know, we're going to be at that same place where I mentioned before, where if we are going to start unleashing robotic systems, and this, and this I'll, you know, I'll make it personal, I'll make it at NAVAIR. I mean, I think NAVAIR is doing the best job that they can 
um, with the people that they have. But Navair doesn't have the best engineers in the world who are doing the X47. Those people are at Google. They're at other places, right? And so it limits our, our ability to innovate and to, to be the best defense force, offensive force in the world, um, because you know those people are going other places. All right, so we have lots of time for questions, I think. Martin, right? We're, we're good. So I, 